Club. Usual, Danny. Like a fish, this one. Never buys a round. <laughs> hey, you know the difference between stories and yarns? Yarns need lubrication. <laughs> We've been drinking in this pub before most of you in heartbeats. Paint that black for me, we whiskey for him. Hot whiskey with cloves if it was bad like outside. Never got all those pants. Too heavy for you, would I mean? Monday club, says he. You sure there's only two of us left? Oh, but he's right. There used to be a Monday club. We started drinking in here after we all met working in the shipyard. Queen's Island. Island men that called us. It was regular work, you know. Hard work. And we earned your wages back then. We'd head round here on a Monday night after we stopped working for a few pence and a bit of crack. You know. Money's a night we spent down here putting the world rights in a drunken stupor. I <laughs> uh, can't remember who it was and I called it the Monday Club. Probably Tony behind the bar. Belfast born and bred, we all were. It was myself, Donnie McClinchy, uh, Big Pot, Ginger Mick, We Paul, Marty, and Stevie. Oh, he was Tony the Barman's wee brother. Oh, why? And Scrubber Crawford. <laughs> Funny how he nicknamed Stick. Scrubber got his nickname because he stole a scrubbing brush from a shipyard one day and got the sack. <laughs> Told us only he took a loan of it. <laughs> Name stuck with him forever. <laughs> Even on the clean windies. <laughs> Who knows what he stole when he was doing that. Looks in the women's bedrooms if I know our Scrubber. <laughs> Still, he was a founding member of the Monday Club. Died when he fell off his ladder, the agent. He was told he was too old to be cleaning with this, but he would never listen. He was always bullheaded with scrubber, you know. So as we lot talk over the windy cleaning, <laughs> sure is not the circle of life. <laughs> Aye. You know, I always wondered what that meant. Until I saw Paul's eldest daughter at the funeral, pregnant. Uh, 
I thought that's Belfast for ye. <laughs> I with all of her yarns to tell. Young and old, male and female. City full of characters, all right. Belfast people are very guarded, you know. Very guarded. You know, that's why instead of saying hello, we say what's a crack. But we'll tell you a good yarn. You all know why us window cleaners always whistle? Just let you know we're coming. Best advice my dad gave me about being a window cleaner. He'd say, son, you gotta learn the Belfast art of looking without looking. And what you see, you keep to yourself. <laughs> like a priest in confession. Although, you never judge. A window cleaner never judges. I remember asking my dad why he whistled going up and down a ladder. And he gave me this story. He was washing the upstairs bedroom window of number 73. It was his old drinking buddy, Stevie Brown's place. Anyways, he's working away and, without looking, sees a pair of big hairy legs hanging off the bed. At the end of the legs were a pair of black socks, one of which had a large hole at the big toe. <laughs> he says, oh I." Must remember to bring that up to the bar next time I see Stevie. Get the crack going, you know what I mean? Anyways, two seconds later, a pair of female legs poke out, start rubbing the hairy ones, as if asking a certain question without using the power of words, you know what I mean? But I seems to think, oh, why? Stevie and the missus having a wee afternoon session. Dirty hallion, why? So, Monday night at the bar, everyone's having a few pints. But ah, he approaches things a wee bit slowly. Stevie, I didn't know you were so religious. Stevie's like, huh? My da, those holy socks you were wearing on Friday the afternoon when you and the missus were having that wee intimate moment. All the lads were starting to laugh. Too busy sowing your wild oats than to sew your socks, Stevie, eh? Stevie, who had remained quiet up to this point. Friday afternoon. I was working all day Friday. Yeah, Stevie and the missus broke up a couple of months later. But... <laughs> He was called Holy Socks for the rest of his days. I think that's where we got that family motto from. A window cleaner never judges. Because someday, the window may become a mirror. Jesus, £7.20, Stephen. I only wanted a drink. I didn't want to pay a bar. There you go. Ginger Mick was one of the funniest characters you could ever meet. He was great crack. But he never had any money. I think he used to give it all the horror indoors. 
I ended up having ten kids. Ten? Imagine. Twelve hours holds under the one roof and only one outside toilet. Any wonder he took to the drink. He'd always end up on one of the boys' money. I think it was Pat come up with the idea that we'd all pull in, you know. So we'd throw a few pounds on the table, I would see Mick through the Monday night, you know. I Pat says to me, you know, you can tell the true wealth of a man, but the number of people that turn up for his funeral. Ah, well, if that was the case, Ginger Mick died a rich man. Then bastard cancer got him. Him on, Marty. Wouldn't wish it my worst enemy. It was there as best as down the docks. Boys that used to work with would be covered in the dust. The white men, they called them. Marty was a big fella too, you know, and same wasted away they got at the end. Well, I always thought the tingly feeling that you get when you like someone was just common sense leaving your body. And then I met her. Beautiful girl. Just a bit shorter than me. Just my type. With long blonde hair. Not her natural color, but that's fine. Nobody really looks why they look. Her eyes. Oh God, her eyes. She, she had these feline shaped eyes that cut right through you. Like right to the truth. Always hard to win an argument, but like everything else, our disagreements were intense. She had this little curve in the corner of her mouth. Like you couldn't see it unless she was smiling. So I would always try and keep her laughing. There is true beauty in imperfection. Like if you're lucky enough, if you find that someone and it works, like, it doesn't get much better. The heart is not just a muscle. Like, you, you can give a name all you want. You can call it chemistry or love. But I always prefer the term magic. And magic is better left unexplained. Unanalyzed. Yeah, I think about her a lot. I wonder where she is. The love of my life? Why did it end? It's better to celebrate and not mourn. And I really enjoyed the magic that we made together. Marty loved the boxing. He was born in Lancaster Street, same street as Randy Mullen, world flyweight champion. 
I might be the first in here every Monday after he stopped work. He'd be sitting at this very table with his wee Jack Russell dog. Rinty, he called it. We dog was no bother, they just sat there quiet, never moved, you know. Boys would be giving it crisps under the table. Like a dog never ate them, just like the flavours off. Marty be talking about the great fights he'd seen in the Ulster Hall. And then when it got dark, one of his wee lads would come down and take a dog home. <laughs> Did spend too much time in the bar though, didn't Marty? Told me he couldn't look at his family and the one he was in a fight that he couldn't win. Anyway, more yarns. I love it when the needle drops and settles into the groove of a record as the turntable revolves. It's the beginning of something. Something magical and I'm partial to its abracadabra. That crackle before the first note is like a campfire struggling to burn dead wood in a cold winter's night. And I crave the anticipation of that first sound. That first note of music you know or are about to be introduced to. It's the chase before the capture. And then the song begins and you start to thaw by the warmth of the sound. My life was a record, you could probably drop the stylus on a track called Functional Family. Dad singing along during his morning shave, mum's hips gyrate as she irons countless dresses. Music birthing a blood-nicked face in well-pressed clothes. Lovers sway to the Friday night music as the children spy with ears and eyes. Two pin the needle so the record won't skip. Spousal accusations yelled in between tracks. Answers discovered in music and song. The needle, the damage undone. Records age, but they never get old. Select my music I'll spend time with and release the vinyl from this cardboard prison. They're not album covers, they're passports. Where will I go to tonight? Nebraska? A hotel in California? The dark side of the moon? <laughs> Mum was right. The best, songs, the best songs take you places. I feel my mood affirmed as a needle ploughs through microscopic dust, journeying onwards, delivering rhythmic answers to life's questions. Dad always said the best songs tell stories. Songs that are an antidote to emotional sabbaticals or unforced sadness. Songs that ask questions and songs that offer answers. Music that defeats the inner enemy. Because rolling vinyl gathers no dross. When I was a kid, our house was always filled with music. Dad would sing along during his morning shave. I mean, he hadn't a note in his head, but at the same time, it's hard to enunciate with your mouth like that. First cut is the deepest. My dad was a DJ, so there was always a soundtrack to my life when I was growing up. I would watch him in absolute awe as he sang along during his records. He had hands like paws. I could barely see the razor he held during his morning shave from my low vantage point, but the tiny hairs gathered in the shaving foam in the sink confirmed a blade. It always reminded me of chocolate sprinkles and vanilla ice cream. The unwanted blood like strawberry sauce. He was human after all. My job was to change or flip the records. There's no like skip button or scrubbing forward on vinyl records. It's an art to drop the needle in the perfect place. I learned all the classics that way. He would turn to me every time the razor left his face to sing the lyrics to me. I was his audience. I was his daughter. The day my mother told me my daddy had left, I didn't believe her. My young mind struggling to make sense. He wouldn't leave without his records. So then my mum took me to our record player and handed me a box and said, there are your records now. 
and a note from my now absent father on the sleeve of his favourite album read all the answers you'll ever need grew up and learned quickly to flip over the album to chase away the silence vinyl is a black mirror it's reflective to pee in the needle so the record won't skip First time I got hit, I didn't even feel it. it. Surprised me too at first, but then the shock finally gave way to the pain. A series of blows from clenched fists pulverizing my face. Eye closing. Mouth bleeding. When the hits just keep on coming, that's when you hear your inner voice. The inner truth. But the problem was that the voice in my head was confirming how much I deserved it. Every single punch to the face was my own fault. He was right. I deserved every single one. I can still hear my grandma's voice in that ring. Keep your guard up. Stop lowering your left after you jab. Don't telegraph your shots and leave yourself wide open. He always taught me that the best fighters were smart enough to hide their weaknesses. So I keep my guard up and I shoot out strong hooks when I see an opening. I land these three good left hooks to the body and steal the air from my opponent. <laughs> As my grand always said, you can't fight if you can't breathe. And then I land this great right hook in the fifth round and BAM! Knockout. <laughs> Rente Monaghan would have been proud of that right hand. TV going something shocking. <laughs> he was the youngest, you know. Hard a goal, like. but Jesus, was he gullible. <laughs> ah, him and Ginger Mick got a job working with the DOE when they started laying people off at the docks. <laughs> Mick told a story about the pair of them. They were up painting white lanes in the middle of the road somewhere. I think it was up near the airport or something. Anyway, <laughs> Stevie really needed the goal. And he kept pestering Mick to stop at somebody's house or a garage so he could use the toilet. Mick was huffing none of it. <laughs> he says, away into the field behind the hedge, he says, it's good enough for the sheep, it's good enough for you. <laughs> and what if somebody sees me, says Stevie, driving by? <laughs> Mick told her the way in his neck and give him a sheet of newspaper, I think it was a sports section. Told her the way up and find a spot there in the field. He'd keep an eye out for him. So away Stevie goes. <laughs> Watch out for them sheep, Stevie. 
Så steg vi faktisk af spot bag hende og havde ikke noget tøj for dem at rute. Takes off the overalls, drops the treasures, and the old monks, and he squats down. <laughs> but he doesn't know that Mecca snuck up on the other side of the hedge, right? And he put a shovel through underneath him. <laughs> so we Stevie takes the quickest shit of his life. <laughs> but unbeknownst to him, it's on the Mecca shovel. <laughs> so he wipes his arse with a sports section. <laughs> And he does what we all do, you know, when we're finished, you know. So we look behind him. <laughs> Mick's long gone. <laughs> He's away down the road with Stevie shaking the shovel. <laughs> he says a family in a car passed him. He says the look on their faces. <laughs> he says it was none of the look on Stevie's, he says, when he get back to the farm. <laughs> Everyone all right, Stevie says, oh, hi, hi, hi. <laughs> ah, dear. Mick told all the boys, but he kept Stevie on the hook for months. <laughs> See the Monday night he told him. <laughs> I swear to Jesus, I thought I was going to die laughing. <laughs> we asked Stevie what he thought had happened. <laughs> he says... I thought I was on a hill. <laughs> or I'd shit in an animal and I'd run away. <laughs> he says, because I could definitely feel it coming out. <laughs> ah, dear, dear. <laughs> We were dying from the day we were born, and life is decay. I was on my way home from work a few days ago. Monday, I think. Head down daydreaming through the changeable Belfast summer. I'll see a dead pigeon at the side of the road. And even though I only glimpsed at it briefly, I could see right through you into its wound and its side. Usually when you see a dead bird, it's been pancaked into the road by a car. But this was the evidence of a different outcome. So the mind searches for a reason. Some kind of logical explanation. I presumed, and it was the best that I could come up with, was that somebody had taken down this poor bird with a pellet gun. Nobody uses catapults anymore. The body was intact, but for that perfect hole. I walked on. But they mean stay with me. Anyways, I'm walking up Pollinger's entry a few days later. And a small bird, no bigger than a chick, crashes into the wall in front of me. Falling on gracefully to the ground, the seagull swoops down, taking the small pigeon in its red tipped beak shaking it and after a fashion it succumbs to its predator I paused and thought about interfering with the natural selection of things but I remained a spectator to death my gaze was only broken by a young boy who walked towards me he looked at the bird and then me as a seagull pecked the small bird's insides hauling it out like a tail He'd never seen death before.
pot makes trollic. Big pot. Pot now with thick as thieves. Like brothers, really. Very quiet, big fella. Especially if the boys were big. Yeah, but it meant that everything he said had real weight behind it. You know. Gravitas, that's a word, aye. Gravitas. Ain't this brilliant way of coming out with these one line bits of advice? <laughs> ah, he'd be happy just to let you drink and he'd sit there listening. Great listener, great listener. Means you ought to be in my company. When all the boys had left, it'd be just me and Pat. That's when he started telling me about his problems at home. Took a while to get in a little of him, mind you, but I'm ah, sure that's life. You never miss the water till the well runs dry. I would sit there talking for hours. See, Pat never really talked to his wife and kids anymore. Well, is he melting your head yet? Talk a leg off a stool, or Danny, but he's harmless, really. He's been drinking in this bar from before I was born. Part of the furniture, that one. Has he told you one about the plant yet? No? <laughs> I'm sure he'll get round to it. Do you see him counting out his coins? Does he even give you the exact change he will? Does my head in. But he spends it in his pocket, fair enough. He'll come up to you with the exact change, and then he'll say, here, Stephen, son, I have a wee tip for you. And then he'll say, don't eat yellow snow or don't buy tights off a mermaid. I laugh every time, you know. <laughs> Customer's always right. He loves his drink, our Danny. He's always the last one to leave. Well, him and Pat. See, he's no kids and his wife died years ago. He's a lonely old fella. I feel sorry for him. Like the rest of them, they come here to forget or drink the pain away. That's the yarn he won't tell you. Now he's left this bar in the legend of the Monday Club. <laughs> Woody starts singing. It's like a cat being kicked up an alley. In a mean abode on the Shankle Road, lived a man named William Bloke. He had a wife, the curse of his life, who always got his goat. So one day at dawn, with her nightdress on, he cut her bloody throat. With a razor gash, he settled her hash. Never was crime so quick. But the steady drip on the pillow slip of her lifeblood made him sick. And the pool of gore on the bedroom floor grew clotted, cold and thick. And yet, he was glad he'd done what he had while she lay there stiff and still. But the sudden awe of the angry law struck his soul with an icy chill. So to finish the fun so well begun, he resolved himself to kill. He took the sheet of his wife's cold feet and twisted it in near rope and hanged himself from the pantry shelf. T'was an easy end, let's hope. In the face of death, with his latest breath, he solemnly cursed the Pope. But the strangest turn of the whole concern is only just beginning. He went to hell, but she got well and is still alive and sinning. For the razor blade was German made, but the sheet was Belfast linen. My mother had reached the end of her time. She died surrounded by her family. At least her family still residing in Belfast. Her death, expected, but no less unbearable. Although everyone commented on how it was a lovely passing. 
May she look at peace. May she left the beautiful corpse. We'll never understand statements like that. The things people spew to offer solace through difficult times. A few minutes before she died, my older brother Michael offered up a macho, sympathetic, head of the family look. And my over-religious aunt clutched her rosary beads. They do nothing to mask her sorrow. Stephen, my younger brother, took it very bad. It's an understatement. Stephen's 16. Yet to fly the family nest. He witnessed firsthand her cancer's descent. Stephen doesn't look a lot like me or Michael and even less like our long lost father. Lovely family has its secrets. It grips Stephen in the back of his head like the brothers we are as everyone lined up to whisper goodbye to my mum. I stood at the back through pure fear hoping that everyone would assume it was some kind of sibling order or politeness. There was a candle flickering in the corner. My uncle, my mother's elder brother, sat at her side. He took one look at me and he realised he knew the night he did more than just to kiss her in the forehead or stroke her silver hair. He stood up and offered me the seat. I sat down and held her hand. This pruned like skin had lost all its elasticity. You could see the pain in her eyes. I leant in and whispered to her, It's me, ma. It's your son. You could see her muster up all the strength she had. I love my mum. She leant over. I want to go, so. I want to go. The answers to everyone in the room could hear. It's alright, ma. It's alright. My mother may be lost to us. But she was never abandoned. And as I watched that gull peck and eat at the inside of its prey. I thought it's not only the dead that's left hollow. Here's a wee yarn for you. Pat and I are walking home the pub one Monday night. Here's Stephen! Another pain, son. And there's a couple of dead men here. This is worse 
bottom on in Belfast though. Anyway, Pat and her walking home the pub this Monday night, holding each other up. Pat singing away as usual, you know. Then I mean a boat on the shank I rode on. I needed to go and shake hands with the wife's best friend. So I goes up as Hendrick. Pat singing away. He had a wife a course of his life. I'm coming to the end of a long stream. Suddenly Pat stopped singing. I thought like he'd fell down drunk again. See when I got to him? Standing in the middle of the road, frozen, colour of death. Like his face was as white as the Belfast linen in the song he was singing. I says, what's wrong here, Pat? Says he, I've just seen a bond she. Says, I went and take your face for a shock, Stephen. God bless her, give her home, son. Sure, aren't you the best bar man in Belfast? <laughs> oh, he tips, Stephen. Never worry. Anyway. Bon she, I says. He trying to wipe my iPod. Nah, he was having none of it. He said he'd seen her. Sitting in the middle of the road with a shawl around her. Singing along with him. He thought it was so bad, doll had fell over. So he went over to help her out. See when he got there. I never forget his words. That was not the face of one of God's children. Now, I mean, Pot could slag with the best of them, don't get me wrong, you know. See, when he started talking about the man upstairs, he knew he was serious. He says the bun she looked right into his eyes, look a pure evil on it, it was pointing down to the ground. He says, what'd you do then, Pot? He says, I kicked her in the back and she disappeared. That's my time up, he says. That was a sign, I'm a goner. I told him to wind his neck in, but he was having none of it. My time's up, he says, I know it. Kept saying that for the next seven years. I think it might have been a drink, you know, or the wife throwing him out that it was a fact no matter what more he had on, you know. Wouldn't let me tell the boys. You see when we were on our own? Made me promise him. He says, Donny, see when I die, don't be put me in the ground, keep me out of down there. So I kept my promise. Stephen, the old Monday night we pull up, bring us fiddle in. It's very talented, we lad, that very talented. Should have played professional. Great singing voice too. Scrober says the old Monday night, here, how come you never made it big? Scrober, he says, I'm sitting here with a paint in front of me and a wee oven. I'm playing to my friends and my family. I have made it. <laughs> Stephen! <sighs> you walked in with your broken eyes Blood on my skin as I watch you improvise We will never be the same And you will never take the blame You shouted something about the past You had some passion but I knew it wouldn't last All this trying is in vain Cause we will never be the same We'll wind some breath is always needed each 
other. We want two brothers, always needed each other. We want two brothers, always needed each other. We want two brothers, always needed each other. We once were nothing ventured, nothing gained. You held me back until I had the shame. All this trying is in vain Cause we will never be the same We want some brothers always needed each other 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 We want some All this trying is in vain Cause I know we both have changed We want some brothers always needed each other 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 we want two brothers always needed each other. We want two brothers always needed each other. We want two. thinking about the thing the north of silence couldn't teach us anything and all this crying is in vain cause we will never be the same we want some brothers always needed each other 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 we want some brothers always needed each other. We want some brothers always needed each other. We want swag. After the rest of the Monday Club had gone, there were just me and Pat left. Sure, we were always lost at Eva Bar anyway. You know. Threw out with the rubbish. <laughs> it was harder to keep a conversation going when it was just the two of you. Well, at least the rounds were cheaper. <laughs> it was this, this one Monday night, and it was just me and Pat, Tony, a barman in the place. It's a well winter's night, really cold. One was howling outside, you know. Like we were three sheets there and anyway, you know. And one cat blowing the door open. <laughs> so it blows open and Pat says, That scrubber, what a biggie, pull up a chair. <laughs> Took me a while figuring out what he was at, like, you know, but then it banged open again. <laughs> I'm Marty, what a biggie, how was the fights? What are you having? <laughs> Oh shit, here's Ginger and Mick. Looks like we're pulling it, lads. Everybody decorate the mahogany. <laughs> Stevie! Stevie, holy sex! How's the wife? <laughs> uh, 
I even joined in. <laughs> Your poor plays a tune in the old fiddle song. What about the one about the Belfast Lemon? Sat there reminiscing for hours. <laughs> Sounds daft, like, but you know, it was like all the boys were there, you know, Monday club all back together again. My <laughs> pot died not long after that. Didn't show up one Monday. Sister phoned the bar, said his heart went to sleep. Just pray the good Lord talk on quick and peaceful. His family didn't want to know him in the last few years. Even less after he died. That was a real tragedy. So I got him cremated up at Roselaw and put his ashes in that wee plant. Bring him with me every Monday night. Still has his whiskey. <laughs> Did you think all that whiskey would kill a wee plant, wouldn't you? The strangest turn and the whole concern And it's only just beginning He went to hell but his wife got well And she's still alive on sinning For the razor blade was German made Oh, the sheets were Belfast linen. Save me from myself, my love, for I don't heal so easy. Paradise seems far from here, but my concern is breathing. And if you see me watching, please don't tell, for I may fall in sorrow break my mouth so I can speak no more soaking in what might have been will never bring tomorrow let's forge a path against my wrath with confidence we'll borrow I won't be long but you'll be gone And while my eyes are burning You told the lie so I wouldn't cry no If we 
Swell up my eyes I know that you're still leaving The words you said Fill my head But the pain is in Believing I know it's wrong to hold on And I hope my head is turning Hold you had made me sad once more. Will we stay? If we turn again